Last lesson, we talked about African geography, the Sahel zone that separates the desert from the grasslands, how the delta of the Niger River was key to growing crops. Um, today, I want to talk about a mystery, a mystery food. One crucial food was missing from the region, something necessary for life. Something you can find today in all breads and canned foods. Something that you need only about a teaspoon of, but if you don't have it at all, you will die. The peoples of Ghana and Mali were willing to trade their most precious goods for this item. All their gold, all the food, they needed this food item. The food item, mystery salt, is salt. Salt is a necessity for life. Yet the kingdoms did not have any salt. Salt is mined in the Sahara and is found there because at one time, thousands of years earlier, the Sahara had been an ocean. In the times of ancient Ghana and Mali, slaves lived in the desert, mining salt in the brutal heat. Camel caravans would then carry the salt slabs to all people in the south. Berbers from the Sahara and North Africa controlled the salt trade. When might the kings of Ghana and Mali have offered to sell them in exchange for this life-giving salt? What could we trade for this salt? Well, the answer is gold, about which there is more in the next slide. Uh, valuable minerals. We're talking gold. Well, <clears throat> Both kingdoms sold a variety of goods for salt. Most famously and frequently traded was gold. Though crops and copper also formed part of the trade. Gold was the most precious mineral of both Ghana and Mali. Gold is valuable because it is rare. For centuries, it has served as currency in many parts of the world. Gold is also desired for its shiny beauty for the making of jewelry, for royal scepters and crowns, for golden domes atop important buildings, and more. The word gold is almost synonymous with wealth, power, and prestige. Ask yourself to think of impressive objects or important events associated with gold. You might think of the Olympics. They have gold medals, right? If you're the best in the world, you get a gold medal. Uh, boxing champs in sports have golden gloves. Um, when, when actors are awarded things, it's the Golden Academy Awards, the Golden Globe Awards. The Oscar is a golden statue. A Grammy is a golden gramophone. And of course, we can't forget to mention gold wedding bands. Wedding rings are made of gold. The gold of West Africa was found not within the kingdoms, but south of them, in the forest region. Ghana and Mali's wealth came from their ability to control the trade in gold. These two kingdoms were in the right location to control and take advantage of this important resource. The kings controlled the trade, buying the gold from the forest peoples to the south, and using some of it within their own kingdoms. The rest of the gold went north across the Sahara. Here again, geography helps explain wealth. Remember al Faki's statement about how and where gold grows? About the carrots? Uh, here it is again. Gold grows in the sand like carrots and is plucked at sunrise. So they, they thought they had a lot of gold. they just go pick it up. Ghana and Mali and the Berbers of the Sahara were not alone in wanting gold. Europe needed gold and was eager to buy it from West Africa. Well, what did Europe need gold for? Um, when we talk about the European Middle Ages, a lot of artwork was produced that used gold. Uh, think the the halos here in this picture. Those are all gold filaments pounded down flat. 
the, the golden halos adorn the angels in, in paintings and golden domes top some of the churches. The churches love to use gold. Artists and architects wanted gold to beautify their works, especially religious works. You see the symbolism gold has is showing holiness in this picture. It's the, the halos are golden. And of course, when you make coins, you want gold coins. So currency, coins, we need gold for that. European merchants had a more practical reason for needing West African gold. They needed it as currency to pay for goods they were buying from the Middle East. Gold was the agreed upon way to pay for goods. If a merchant didn't have gold, he was likely to be cut out of trade. West Africa was the source of gold, both for Europeans and for the people of the Middle East. The coins of the mid, uh, European Middle Ages might be called Florentines after the city of Florence, or they might be called doubloons as they were in England, but whatever their names, all the gold came from West Africa. Thus, the trade in gold was crucial for the economies of three regions, West Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. These regions were interconnected. They traded with each other and learned from each other. The Mediterranean was a sea that brought them together. You can see the between the malls, the Mediterranean Sea. How valuable was gold? And this gold was highly sought after and valuable. In fact, as far back as the 700s AD, Ghana exported a ton of gold each year to the Mediterranean region. Later, those ton the tonnage rose much higher. Christopher Columbus traveled to a West African port town before he crossed the Atlantic to the Americas. He went to African port, the Portuguese called Almenia. Now, if you know Spanish and Portuguese, you know that Almina means the mine. Columbus was going to a port called the mine, searching for gold, just as he was about to do in the Americas. He went there to look for gold, trade with China. In West Africa, he already knew that gold was there. What he needed was to get to the source of the gold. He wanted to buy it directly and save the charges the Berbers of North Africa added for their work in transporting it. But as we know, the gold was inland. There were still middlemen, only this time they were closer to the gold. Almina was built by Portuguese in 1482, during the 16th and 19th centuries. Almina was a major slaveholding location. Slaves were brought from inland regions and kept in the fort to transport across the Atlantic. Today, Almina Castle, or Fort, is a World Heritage Monument. Many African Americans visit it as part of uncovering their African roots. The Sahara is the world's largest desert. Many think of it as a barrier, separating North Africa from the lands to its south. During the period of these two kingdoms, the Sahara proved to be a passage between North and West Africa. The Sahara had been described by some as an ocean, with the lands of North and West Africa as its shores. The word Sahel literally means shore in Arabic and is used as the common geographic term for the inland region of West Africa, which is just south of the ocean of the Sahara. What then were the ships that carried the trade across this ocean between North and West Africa? Well, these the ships that traveled this ocean of sand were camels, animals perfectly suited for such difficult travel. Famous for the ability to walk long distances with little water, they have other desert crossing features. Wide hooves that do not sink in the sand, and long eyelashes that could keep blowing sands from stinging or blinding them. Finally, they can comfortably carry people and goods. So, what are the, the ports on this Saharan Ocean? The cities that dotted the northern and southern sides 
with such names as Gao, Jinna, Timbuktu on the south, each of these places can still be visited today. The northern ports are Tunis, Mareka, Fez, and others, all of which remain cities today. This is the caravans. You see how they're using the camels to travel, and the camels, you can ride on them, you can pack them up with things. You don't see a lot of water, so you're going to need a camel, uh, because the camels don't need to drink every day. Ghana and Mali traded goods long distances to peoples and states to their north and south. Besides gold, the kingdom sold copper, iron, ivory, animal hides, dates, and slaves to the north. To the south, they sold copper as well, plus cereal grain, salt, and other goods. From the north, including from Europe and the Middle East, they purchased manufactured goods, such as knives, silks, velvet, jewelry, carpets, and perfume, as well as prized horses, important for the king's armies. Overall, the trade included both luxury goods destined for the nobles and the kings, as well as more affordable or necessary items for ordinary people, think the salt. Each region or zone in West Africa, North Africa, Europe, and the Middle East had something valuable to people in other zones. So let's sum up this ge geographic features. The land was fertile along the Niger River, making it possible for people to specialize in different work. With the specialization, people became artists, musicians, builders, scholars, religious leaders, and more. King could feed and clothe a standing army and offer gifts to those who gave him loyalty. The territory of both kingdoms included several different vegetation zones. Because of this variety of zones, the kingdoms could grow a greater assortment of foods and take part in agricultural trade, which made the peoples of the kingdoms healthier and wealthier. The location of Ghana and Mali made it possible for them to trade in valuable minerals such as gold, copper, and salt. From these minerals, the kingdom grew in wealth. Here's some discussion questions on Google Form. <clears throat> 